Uh, أنا اسمي شريف كوسا. Um, and uh, let me tell you something. Sorry, I, I have to talk in English because I've done these always in, in English. But I'm going to speak Arabic. Is that okay? Let me tell you something else. I'm the only one who's standing between you and lunch. So, so let's try to get this over with quickly so that we can all get to lunch, which is why are we all here today, right? So today I would like to talk about um, um, security code review. Um, and I have a different view of, of code. I have a different view of code. Um, how many of you guys are developers, software developers? All right, let's say 5%, uh, 10%. How many of you are pen testers? All right. Uh, IT? None. Uh, project managers? Few. What the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Just here for the lunch? Man. All right, so, so I have a view of, of, of source code. I have a view of source code. So whatever you do, in order to succeed in security, you have to be comfortable with source code. You have to be comfortable with source code. Let me explain what that means. So I've seen pen testers, for example, that they are very comfortable with a scanner you give them the source code of the application that they're looking at, and they don't care. Do you see how ridiculous this is? So they are most comfortable. They trust the vulnerability scanner, whatever that was, the burp, or app scan, or what have you. But you give them the source code of the application itself, which has all the secrets. And because they are not comfortable reading source code, they cannot find the bugs. And they go back to their comfort zone, which is a vulnerability scan. Right? So I'm on a mission to make everybody comfortable in the security industry, whether you're a pen tester, reverse engineer, um, um, IT developer, comfortable with looking at source code and finding the vulnerabilities in source code. By the end of this session, I'm going to give you a very simple process to go over, if you have a piece of source code, a very simple process to go over and figure out what are the vulnerabilities in that source code. Sounds good? So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up here in Egypt, was graduated from Alexandria University, computer science, worked at IT Works. Anybody here from IT Works by any chance? Yes? Oh, okay. Uh, worked for five years and then moved to Canada in 2005. Worked as a software developer all the way until 2008. Got involved with OWASP. Um, was the, anybody familiar with uh, WebGoat? OWASP WebGoat. OWASP WebGoat is a vulnerable application uh, created by OWASP to teach developers how vulnerabilities happen. So I was the team lead on version 5. One thing linked to the other, I find myself helping SANS writing their exams. So I helped write two exams, GSSP Java and GSSP.NET, uh, 500 questions in total. One thing led to the other, I find myself working in the security code review at Wells Fargo, the third largest bank in the US. I did that for a year and a half, and then I founded Software Secured. Software Secured is an application security consultancy firm. We do three things. We do something called penetration testing as a service. We do security uh, training for developers. And we just launched our tool called Reshift, a static code analysis tool targeted for developers. So before this talk, I find myself, I just did a very, very rough count. I find myself reviewed about a little bit more than 100 million line of code. So there's a bunch of things that I learned across this journey. And I'd like to share that with you uh, right now. Before we do that, how do you describe source code? How do you describe source code? What is source code? <laughs> Smart. He said storyteller. What else? Why? Why is it a storyteller? So, developers in the room, you see source code, please. It's not just a normal story, it's more than this. It actually tells you 
They told me there are balls here, so let's use those balls. You gonna catch? Whoa, that was so bad. <laughs> so he's absolutely right. So the source code, starting from the very high level, you just have, if you're using GitHub or using uh, uh, CVS or what have you, from a very high level, you understand the first thing, you look at the source code, you understand the programming language. You delve in a little bit, you understand the technology stack, right? So you see a web.xml, you're using Java, and using web, and there's probably a bunch of serverless GSPs. You see a PHP file, you kind of understand what's going on. You delve in a little bit, you understand the whole technology stack, the database, the, the web server, et cetera, et cetera. You start looking into the code, and then, uh, you start to understand what is the business of that application. Uh, what is the application is there to serve, right? Is it an e-commerce application, healthcare application, insurance application, or what have you? You start to delve in a little bit, and um, you start to understand that the, the, the source code is actually trying to tell you stories. The source code is trying to tell you stories. And I'm here to prove to you that source code is actually a storyteller. So you're absolutely right. I know. Oh, yeah, you, you, you'll get a ball. <laughs> so it's actually a storyteller, and it wants to tell you the story about itself. It wants to reveal the stories that it's hiding. Let me, um, and, and I'll tell you how. So for example, this is a very well-documented a uh, piece of code, and it tells you exactly how this function works. Not all the code are like that, I understand. But most code, if you read it well, you will understand exactly what the code is trying to tell you. You delve in a little bit more, you will understand the culture of the developers who are actually trying to write that. So I'm not going to read that out loud because it has some not great language in there, right? But you start to understand the culture inside that company, right? And you, st you start to understand some of the rant stories that's going on within that developers, right? So in here, when I wrote this, only God and I understood uh, what I was doing. Now, God only knows. Dear maintainer, once you're done trying to optimize this routine and have realized what a terrible mistake that was, please increment the following counter as a warning to the next guy. Right? You delve a little bit more, you understand a little bit more as if you were with that team while they were writing the software. The second thing I want to tell you about code, it's an archaeologist. Right? <coughs> You guys understand what an archaeology is, right? An archaeology is basically the science of understanding the environment and the evidence of how things develop. So when they find a tomb in Luxor or whatever, that's an archaeology site because it tells them about a little uh, piece of the history that was missing about this particular uh, uh, pharaonic family or, or what have you, right? So code is archaeology, archaeology site actually. How's that? Software, it turns out to be that there is actually something called software archaeology. And basically, according to Wikipedia, software archaeology is the study of poorly documented or undocumented legacy software implementations as part of software maintenance. So even though the code might not be uh, properly documented, you can still deduce a lot of the characteristics of that code. How? Reverse engineering, so uh, uh, Muhammad just talked to us about reverse engineering and malware. So you can reverse engineer code and understand a lot about that, what, how that code was working. Version control, so you run a tool on your GitHub or Git uh, 
newspaper in general, and you will be able to harvest a lot of uh, information about that repository, including secrets, back passwords, um, uh, a lot of the previous versions, etc. Dependency management, that will tell you a lot about what the application is using as far as open source projects. Why does that all matter? What does that have to do with security? Because code is also a snitch. Code is also a snitch. How's that? How many developers here in the room again? About 20%? Okay. Let me know if you resonate with this story. You have a deadline coming up three months from now. Developers are working. You're racing up against the clock. Uh, uh, the client has been changing the requirements on you more than once. You still think you can beat the deadline. You're working really hard. Three weeks before the release, testers start hitting the application. They find a shitload of bugs. You're still going straight. You still th think you're going to meet the deadline. You push, 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 push. Few days before the release, you push the application to staging. You have done all the tests. As soon as it hits staging, you find a bunch more bugs. You push, you push, and you finally think you're ready for production because, well, we went over it and tested it. QA went over it and tested. We put it on staging and it's working. And the only final thing is pushing it to production. And the very first thing that happens in production is what? This. Am I right? It never works in production. Never works in production, no matter how much testing have you done. Why is that? Because code, source code, is a snitch. It want to tell you want to tell everybody about how a shitty job you have done as a developer cutting corners and not doing proper requirements and not doing proper QA and cutting corners all through the, just to make the deadline. Let me give you another example. Right? Anybody familiar with this? So basically this is Samsung code and Samsung inadvertently uh, disclosed source code that included AWS keys, private keys, and IDs, right? That's another evidence that source code wants to reveal itself. It, wanna, it, wants, to come, um, it wants to come public. What about this? .NET, who was asking about .NET a little bit ago, right? If you have wrote code in .NET, you are very, very intimate with this screen. You know what this screen means. So basically, uh, uh, this screen is, is, is a very, um, very well-known screen for .NET when there's an exception, uncaught exception, runtime exception, you're met with one of those screens. So what is this? This is your code telling the world how shitty code you have written, right? That's why there is there is exception. Look, I'm exaggerating, but what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to tell you that so don't think of your source code as a private um, entity. Your source code is basically interacting with the, with, the, with, the, with the outside world. Your source code has a lot of secrets, and attackers wants to, want to get to those secrets. And there are a lot of ways for them to get to those secrets. Or your source code can be all stolen. Right? For example, that engineer flees to China after stealing source code from US train firm. Insider attack. How can you prevent against that? Pretty hard. Right? So how do we prevent source code from snitching? because it is going to snitch. It's going to be stolen inadvertently. Sorry, was there a question? Sorry? Error handling, yeah, that's, that's one way. That's one way. So I was saying that source code wants to, exp 
to, to, to get the word out about itself. It wants to expose itself, either through error handling, either through an insider attack, uh, either through a reverse engineering, uh, either by mistake, right? But you cannot assume that source code is hidden uh, from attackers. So what do we do about that? So my mission is to make every single person inside the development organization, whether a, um, a developer, a QA, a uh, security engineer, a pen tester, at least familiar with source code, at least comfortable with source code, understand when they see a piece of code, they understand what's the problem and they do better with that source code as far as security. So that's why I love security code review. According to OWASP, security code review is the process of auditing a piece of software to verify that the proper security controls are actually present, working, and have been invoked in all the right places, right? Read that definition a little bit. Security controls are present, working, and invoked at all the right places. And don't assume that the three come together by, uh, by default. It could be present, but not working, and not invoked could be present and working, but not invoked, right? So I have to make sure that the security controls are present, working, and invoked in all the right places. So anybody have done security code review here before? All right, about 5%. Uh, okay, anybody done pen testing here before? Okay, so what's the difference? Anybody can tell us the difference for a, for a ball? <laughs> yeah, what's the difference? That should be easy. Please. Right, and the source code, code. Slightly better than the last time. So basically, pen testing, you are testing the application in its running state. So there is the application and the way you're testing the application by bouncing stuff just as I bounce the ball right now and see what the results are coming from the application. If it's as you expect, then there is no bug. If it's different than what you expect, then potentially there is a bug. Source code, on a security code review on the other hand, I'm actually looking at the source code that made up this application in the first place, right? Two different ways looking at security testing. Two different ways of looking at security testing. So why? Penetration testing is, is easier. You have the scanners. You don't, you don't need to understand uh, the programming language of, of that particular application. Um, you don't need to be a developer. It looks like penetration testing is kind of like an easier way to go about it. So why bother with security code review, right? I'll tell you why. If you're pushing left in your software development lifecycle, if you want to integrate security earlier into the software development lifecycle, security code review is a little bit better suited towards that. A little bit better suited towards that. Let me tell you why. If you're a pen tester, one of the worst things you can face, one of the worst engagement you can face is testing an application that is not ready. Am I right? Right? You keep sending, you run your scanner, and your scanner runs out of memory. Why? Because all of the requests are timing out. Why? Because the application is not responding properly. Why? Because the application is not ready, right? Security code review, you don't need the application to be running at all. You just need to have a look at the source code. Deeper attack surface analysis, what does that mean? So again, for pen testing, you are testing what you can see you are testing what a normal browser can see, right? So the way, browser, the, the way vulnerability scanners work is they start with, an, with, they start with a URL, you, they send a request to that URL, they get back some sort of, a, of an output for the sake of simplicity, let's assume it's an HTML file. They take that HTML file, parse it, look for all of the other URLs in that HTML file, for each one of those URLs, they send another request and get back the result. This is called crawling. 
So they crawl the website looking for all of the possible, um, for all of the possible um, uh, attack services, all of the possible URLs, all of the possible APIs, all of the possible uh, ways to get to that URL, get post header, uh, sorry, get post, uh, put, delete, etc. right? What if there is a particular piece of the application that is not called from anywhere? Let's say it's an admin piece of the application. There is no URL. There's no URL to that uh, that you can see. The scanner would be oblivious to that piece of the application. So if you're a pen tester, and there is a piece of the application that is not referenced from anywhere. You cannot see that piece. You have to come to it by accident or by experience. On the other hand, if you have the whole source code, you can see everything. You are not bounded by what a browser or a vulnerability scanner can crawl. Does that make sense? Yeah? No? Any questions so far? This is well suited for developers. So uh, developers, uh, developers in the room, y you have particular way of doing things. You love your IDEs, right? If you're working with Eclipse or Visual Studio or what have you, you love your IDEs. You love your command line. Um, you have command line open, you have the ID open, you have your source control open, and your music. Right? Vulnerability scanners are foreign to software developers. They are foreign to software developers. So I taught literally hundreds of developers. While they do appreciate the activity of pen testing, it's not their comfort zone. It's not their comfort zone. So it is a stretch to get a developer to run a vulnerability scanner, for example. But it's not a stretch to teach developers um, application security fundamentals and make it part of their DevOps pipeline or make it part of a, of a, code, a regular code review checklist because it involves code, right? Fits naturally within an SDLC, especially a DevOps pipeline, or for example, a Git workflow. So anybody here working with Git workflow? Right? So a Git workflow is basically, there is a master branch, you're developing a feature, you branch off that master branch, do your thing, when you're ready, you merge. Usually before you, mer before you merge, just to make sure that you're not introducing bugs into the master branch, you're actually doing kind of like a PR, pull request. That pull request is basically the delta between your branch and the master branch, and some senior engineer would look at that pull request, make sure that everything is in place. Make sense? So it fits naturally within that theme of how developers work. All right, let me give you a little bit more evidence on why security code review will give you a completely different view on, uh, th uh, than what a pen test would do or any other sort of security test. Can you guys see at the back? Can you see at the back? Shaifin Menorah? Yeah? Okay. What's the bug here? Let me get a ball ready. There's a bunch of bugs, by the way. Zoom in? Slava good then. Zay. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Is that better? I think the bugs are mostly here. Yep. So according to Ahmed Safan, I'm just going to take the cursor out. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, please. Sorry? Line five. Byte encrypted. What's the problem? As a practice. 
the brackets. So it's an array of bytes. That's all. Okay, please. Um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, please. The key is in plain text. Okay. No. The size of the IV. Okay. Okay, that's, that's one bug. There is a bigger bug for those who write .NET code. Think, of, yeah, please. Should it be should it be dynamic rather than static? Dynamic generation of the key? Yes. That would be much better. So you got a ball for that. Oops, sorry. Still bad at throwing. Damn. There is another bug. Yeah, please. I think there is no limitation on the size of the uh, uh, MS encrypt to the two array. Uh, I think the output of that array maybe uh, result in a stack overflow because the encrypted uh, has no limitation. So, so uh, line 17, is that what you're talking about? So if I remember properly, .NET is going to handle that gracefully. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember properly, .NET will handle that gracefully. Think about the default encryption mode in .NET for Rigendell. The, 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 you know there are modes, right? CBC and ECB, right? Right? So what Anybody knows? It's ECB. Do you know the difference between ECB and CBC? Okay. So um, CBC, ECB, which is the less secure one, basically takes the IV and the key. So what happens is that you take a plane of text, a, a block of plane of text, and you transfer it into encrypted text, right? How does that happen? It takes a chunk of the plain text, encrypts it, and creates a chunk of encrypted text, and then take the next chunk, same method, and creates a chunk of encrypted text, right? What's the problem with that? The problem with that, if there was the similar word in those two chunks of plain text, they will appear exactly similar in the chunks of encrypted text, right? CBC, on the other hand, will do the same, will take a chunk of encrypted, of plain text, convert it into encrypted text, and will take the IV, right? And will take the output of that and put it inside the operation of encrypting the second chunk of plain text. What that means is, if there is a piece of plain text that appears in two chunk, it's going to appear differently in the encrypted text. What that means is, if somebody was able to get the encrypted text, they will not be able to what the uh, what the plain text was. So that's the difference between ECB and CVC. When they go to .NET Core, it becomes the right. defaults is the primitive of whatever operating system you are using. You're absolutely right. That code is, is not core. So not that code. The .NET Framework, it's an old one, right? Yeah, that's correct. Because I expected automatically that it's going to take the default. Yeah. Good question. So what if it's not? So that's, that's a good point. So that has changed in the latest uh, .NET Framework. But before that, that was, not, that was not the default. That's a good point. Oh, I lost that. Okay. What about this? By the way, this piece of code was um, in a real life application, insurance application. It was rewritten just to neutralize the code. 
uh, after permission, but it's not something that I made up. So anybody can identify what the problem is? There are a couple of very obvious problems, and there is one that deserves a t-shirt, I think. Come on. Yeah, please. Using the SHA-1. Uh, okay, SHA-1 is, one is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but can you zoom? Uh, yeah, I can zoom. Yeah. So there is another simple problem and another more complex problem. <laughs> Let's not do that anymore because <laughs> I've proved that I suck at, uh, at throwing balls. That should be easier. Yeah, please. Sorry? Log injection? Uh, not sure because the E is no such algorithm exception. So there is no way to inject E if I'm not mistaken. Right? Somebody's talking. Sorry. Yeah. Because uh, the input is not checked. Uh, the uh, size. So if I remember correctly, this was .NET code or JavaScript code. How much time do I have? Arabnasa. Uh, so just just to go on with the time, it's missing it's missing assault, right? So this code is assaulted. So that's the other obvious problem. But there is a little bit of a, a bad bad problem. What happens if there was an exception? What happens if there was an exception? Please. Yes? Algorithm root reset. Algorithm equal null. Algorithm equal null. Where is that? Oh, here? Oh. And then it's trying and then logging. But it yeah. will head this line anyway. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And then what? It will crash the application. Um, That's a very good point. So you deserve a t-shirt for that. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry about that. There is another problem. So the other catch, What happens with the other catch, with this catch at line 26? What happens with line 26, right? A assuming that the algorithm ex exists, like uh, assuming that line nine works, right? But there is some other exception somewhere else in the application. So it's gonna hit the catch, right? It's gonna hit the catch and then what? It's gonna send, it's gonna send back, let's say that this is, was a pass that was supposed to be hashed is going to return the plain text password. Complete failure, right? Complete failure. You thought you, that you're hashing your, uh, your password using a shitty hash, SHA-1, but you're hashing your passwords, right? You're not hashing anything. Sorry? It happened with Facebook. They happened with Facebook. Exactly. Happened yeah. with Facebook. So that's another uh, <laughs> example. All right, one, a couple more. Where am I? Right here. What about this? This is a pretty famous CVE, 2018-117-76. Yeah, please. Have. Do you, do you have any idea which, uh, which CVE that was? Anybody know a company called Equifax? That's what, that was it. That was it. That was the piece of code. That, that, this is a very small piece because the, the code was, was really big, couldn't fit in one, but this was the beginning of it where um, uh, it had a templating system, and basically that templating system was vulnerable to RCE, remote command execution, right? 
another one that everybody should be familiar with. Let me see. Yeah, you get the whole thing here. That should be very easy. Yeah, please. Harbleed. Yes. That was the code. The one line of code right here, line 26. That was the offensive line. Anybody know what exactly happened? What, what Harbleed? Yeah, please. There was supposed to be a Harbleed signal where you send five bytes forward, send five bytes back. Right. Do you guys hear that? Right? So there was a there was a there was a, a heartbeat functionality. What that means is the client wants to see if the server is alive. To do that, it would send a message and it would send the length of the message. So for example, we would send hello and five, because hello has five characters, right? Uh, and the server was supposed to send back the message that it received. So if I'm a client, I send the message, if I got the message back, I know that the server is alive, we can start the communication. Except that the server wasn't actually checking that hello is actually five bytes. So what happens, the vulnerability was, I send hello, and for example, 5,000. What's gonna happen? The server is gonna send me back hello, plus the next 4995 bytes from the memory. What usually exists in the memory of the server? All good stuff, <laughs> right? For an attacker, all the good stuff for the attacker, right? Here you go. Oh, getting better. Get, oh, the t-shirt, the t-shirt. Did I give the t-shirt away? No? What is it? Oh, it's gone, sorry. <laughs> all right. So challenges. So if it's that good, why people aren't doing it? Why people aren't doing it? From my experience, it's one or more of these factors. They lack the process, they lack the proper skills, they lack the tool, or they lack the time. Process, skills, tool, or time, right? More often than not, it's more than one of these, right? So I'm about to give you a very simple process that will make that a little bit easy. But just to understand, just to set expectations, there are different types of security code review. There is ad hoc security code review, automated security code review, peer-to-peer -peer security code review, hybrid, and tool assisted. Ad hoc is basically what happens when we just need to look at the piece of code. Automated code review is just running a tool, running a static code analysis tool. Peer-to-peer -peer security code review is when two people come together and sit um, and review a piece of code together. Hybrid security code review is something that is called when there is no, nothing else to be called, right? When there is no other process to do. Tool assisted security code is what we are going to discuss now. So tool assisted security code review is basically a type of code review that uses static code analysis augmented by a, manu by a person who is actually manu manually looking at the results of the, uh, of the five minutes or done? Five minutes? Hmm? Okay. 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 So, the, <laughs> sorry. So the simplified process. You're looking for two things. You're looking to from the source and the sink. The source and the sink. The source is an untrusted input. The sink is where the problem actually happens. Right? And you are trying to figure out what payload, what bad thing can travel from that source to the sink that can lead to a vulnerability. What bad thing can travel from the source to the sink um, that can lead to a vulnerability. You have to wear two hats. The hat of an attacker to come up with a payload that could work and the hat of a mailman, Raghur al barid to make sure that nothing happened to that payload from the source to the sink, right? Let me give you an example. The source is basically how untrusted, you're figure, trying to figure out how untrusted um, is this as a source. So for example, bad sources are HTTP requests, input users, user, uh, input that's coming from a user, cookies, 
something that's coming from another application, API endpoints, anything that is fed into an API endpoint, all of that is insecure. Uh, a payload is basically a SQL injection payload, cross-site scripting payload, something like that. A sync is basically something where it executes a command or somewhere where that, where that payload is actually becoming a vulnerability. Mitigating control is anything that can change the nature of the payload. For example, a sanitization uh, control. For example, um, converting that uh, uh, casting, for example, from a string to an int, from an int to a string. All of that could be a mitigating control. Your job is trying to take that payload from the source to the sink and make sure that nothing can happen to it that will change the nature of the payload. So let me give you an example quickly. So this is a tool called Reshift. It's, this is our tool, but it's free. Um, you can use it to scan Java code. So I'm just going to give you quickly an example of what that means. So this is scanning an application called Java Vulnerable Lab. It's something like so you can use it to learn application security. So SQL injection, for example, here is an issue, right? So you can see here, string, this is the source, string user equal request dot get parameter. Is that untrusted? Yes, because it's coming from the request. And it ends up in uh, an execute query in here. So let's look at the execute query because it's cut from the screen. Right here, this line, right? So the user ends here. So is, ask yourself three questions. Is the source untrusted? Yes, right? Because it's coming from the request. Is the sync a credible sync? This is a SQL statement, so it cannot be more credible than that. Did anything happen to the variable, which is user here? Did anything happen from the source to the sync? Was it changed in nature? Was it casted? Was it cleansed? Was it sanitized? Do you see anything? No. So we have, we have an issue. We have a problem. One last. Um, let's look at cross-site scripting, for example. So here is the source. I'm requesting, I'm getting a file name from the request, right? And it ends up here, out.print, out.print. Where is this printing? So you can look up a little bit, and you probably found that it's printing to the response. It's printing out to the response. So it's printing back to the user. And the tool is telling me that this is a cross-site scripting issue. Sorry. The tool is telling me that this is a cross-site scripting issue. So is this, is this credible as a source, right? Is this untrusted? It's coming from the request, HTTP request. So obviously, it's untrusted, right? It's going back to the HTML response. Is it, is it credible? Yes, right? Did anything happen? between the source and the sink? No. So you have, you have a bug. All right, so that's everything I have. So hopefully, I'm going to share the, the, um, the, the slides with you guys. Here's my LinkedIn, Twitter. Contact me anytime. But hopefully, I made the case that you should be comfortable with looking at source code. You don't need to be a great software developer. All what you need to be is comfortable with the source code, reading source code and understanding what it does and have that developer hat, sorry, the attack hat to understand what bad things can happen to that source code. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Send me any questions that you have. Glad to be here at AppSec. And, and thank you guys for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, please. Okay. 
the vulnerabilities you show, uh, I think that in the last few years, if you follow software development patterns mm -hmm. while you're writing codes, mm -hmm. for example, SQL injection, mm -hmm. if you are not using an ORM, you are done. Right. You shouldn't be writing SQL by your hand. Right. Unless it's very specific cases. Right. Uh, crypto, you shouldn't write your own crypto libraries. You should yes. use trusted existing one or natively. So my question, just to rephrase it, two things. First, if the patterns, that the, the, the idea of insourcing, like treating your code as if it's public code, mm -hmm. so this is point number one, do all the patterns correctly, because even Microsoft adopted this recently, that all the code internally or externally gonna be in-source concept. Okay. Uh, step number two, you said in the slide that static code analysis are not good enough. Is it still till now? Because for tools, something like Resharper, for example, for .NET, it started detecting like 90% of the bad behavior while I'm writing code. So static code analyzers steal that bad inside the IDE without going to unfavored tools for the developers. That's my two questions. So the question is, are they still bad or do they think, are they still bad? No, I think they're getting they're, they're getting bad water, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was the second question. The first question that, yeah, gotcha. So you're absolutely right. So frameworks started to do a whole lot better, right? Um, for example, ORMs. Uh, it's really a bad idea right now to not use However, um, .NET might not be the best case. Let's take another uh, example such as Java that is not doing as much as .NET is doing. In my opinion, .NET is doing the best. Out of every other language, it's doing the best as, as far as including security controls built into the framework. Uh, there are little things that not net, .NET still missed. I'll give you an example. For example, most of .NET controls, ASP.NET controls, are encoded by are encoded by default, right? That's 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 another thing. So before, right, right. So so there are gaps. What I'm trying to say is that there are gaps in the framework that the framework is not doing. Although .NET is one of the best that is including security controls. Laravel, for example, for, to support your case with GAMP to, to Java, Laravel is not doing enough to protect exactly. against Exactly. Yeah. So there are still gaps that the frameworks are not doing, mm -hmm. and the responsibility falls onto the developer. With right. the patterns, that's, that's with, my point. With the patterns, right. Yeah, you right. should use the software patterns, take everything from the book and try to apply it in order to have a good architecture to avoid this. So good architecture is, is a good, um, is one good step, but in my experience, most of the problem, problems happens in implementation. There are implementation details. Um, so um, a, state, a, a SQL, so you're using an ORM and somebody just write their own SQL. Yeah, using the, my passing, yeah. Right, the, the, the framework is not gonna help you there. Right, things like that. You didn't check for title and check, so uh, you can have an IDOR, parameter manipulation, yeah. right? So things like that. So your second question about static code analysis, they are getting a whole lot better. Uh, um, um, I'm not sure where I said it's, it's, it's not good, but static code, uh, what I've said is static code analysis alone is not enough, right? Static code analysis, just letting static code analysis, you'll end up with a lot of false positives. It, it, just, it just helps. But it's not alone. It's not. It's not. It's not enough. Any other questions? Yeah. For I'll I'll share this the whole uh, the whole slides. So Hassan just told me I'm hungry. So I agree with him. So if you have any questions, I'm available. Just uh, stop by and let's have a conversation. But thank you guys. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>